Dust song of justice, from dust to dust, we still speak to one another. It's a hundred years from today. And today, I held your hand earlier. You gently tipped my head from my chin until my forehead stopped in and burrowed in the crock of your neck. Just hold me, just hold me. From dust to dust, between non-entity to non-entity, I, you, we are not human anymore because the world has exploded into nothingness. But I still remembered you, leaving me, loving me. Was there something we could have done to prevent this? The children we brought into this world, we knew, would live and grow into a planet so different from ours. They would not get to see the coast as the rising seas overcome any memories made. Their walks are not gallant as we experience them. Something as simple that we enjoyed, like a seaside walk, on the weekends is a horrifying flight, a dreamscape that stereo sounds into our minds. The erosions rises, the land burns in California, and smoke fills the air, and my lungs, and your lungs, and my body, and your body into dust. This is not a horror poem. This is not an apocalyptic poem. This is not an equal justice poem. All I want to do here is testify and to speculate in this poem that is mine. Let me tell you, all the fat millionaires arrived suddenly to the place where no one had wanted to live. But here is water and greenery and here is safety and so they build bunkers so no one else can live here and they sing ugly songs and they continue to grow fat and old and stay dumb all i ask of you is to keep me safe to feed me seaweed and to commit to living even through the burning earth and us transforming into dust I cherish water. I cherish you. I crave holding your hand now. I love your handsome face. I love how you look at me. I resolve to the memories made. My babe, my babe, we made life only to see the planet explode in the rising. They made waste. They hid the waste and they danced all night and day in plastic dresses. I hope to never see them again. I hope they choke on dust. The planet's temperature rises, my temperature falls. Carbon footprints weave us into a world that is just, I want something simple and free. What is time? What is beauty? What is justice? I imagine the children we brought into this world, that they traveled to Mars, a Mars, a planet that is habitable, that is temperate, that is beautiful, that has nature and green, a place where we are free and of light. We are dust, and this is just one song.
Hello, my name is Zakaya. I um, was first drawn to, to food justice because I had been working as a waitress and then later a restaurant floor manager for years. And, you know, people would ask a lot of questions about, oh, oh this food, this food, and they wanted stories about the food, you know, and, and, then, and then watching, you know, people in the kitchen prepare all of this stuff. And I'm like, oh, I started thinking like, oh, where is all this come, where, where's all this coming from? And then I was like, it would be really cool if I learned how to grow food. Um, and it, it was birthed out of that, out of wanting, wanting to learn more about where food was coming from. And that's how I got to food justice. My name is Pam. I come from Florida. I like, grew up in Miami and very like luscious green Everglades and whatever and came to New York. And there's definitely a lot of nature here. It's not that there isn't nature, but I started to realize like how much I how much plants and nature really affected me on like an emotional level like health. I felt healthier around plants. I felt better emotionally. So realizing that then I started of course to collect a bunch of plants inside my house and then I loved flowers and then I became like I trained to be a florist and I just wanted to learn all about plants and then in growing plants of course then it's like growing food and then getting into like food justice and learning all about that and also seeing like bodegas on every corner but no like grocery stores with like some good produce also was um pretty like eye awakening to me and so my name is Jessica I got my first plant after I had a loss of a, a sudden loss of a friend I like walked into this plant store and I got this plant and then that plant turned into like so many other plants and it kind of spun a little out of control I found out that it just made me feel good. And discovering that feeling, I just wanted more of it. So then I was like, how can I make this a daily part of my life? Like, how can this just become what I wake up and, and do? And I discovered this thing called horticultural therapy, which I now have ever growing feelings about. That kind of led me to the, the program where I met Pam and Zakaya and there were lots of aspects to to that program but it changed I think my perspective of the society we live in and what role people play in it what role plants play in it yeah so we all worked for a nonprofit who does horticulture stuff on Rikers Island when I took that job I didn't realize exactly what I was getting myself into and it it kind of feels like almost yeah. irresponsible absolutely they did not prepare us for what we were going to be dealing with it was just like oh you know you go and get your clearance badges or whatever it's called, volunteer pass that's what it was get your volunteer pass and then oh we're just teaching about mm -hmm. plants it is so much more than that and we it it it, it took our cohort of instructor instructors to like have weekly meetings and we would talk about what we were seeing and we would we would unpack what was happening and it, it and and for that organization it was just like oh we're no we're just teaching plants and it's like it they they it was such a siloed and such a, mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. a way of 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 going about interacting with folks who were on the inside and it it it, it was just like there was, it was gross it was well, really it was, gross yeah. it was really gross and it, it was just like you know i mean we we've 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 seen people dismissed from the program because they 
they weren't engaging. They didn't work that day. And it wasn't taken into account that, oh, this person had a really shitty phone call with a loved one because there's some, some drama happening in the town. And I mean, it was just so, it was so, I, I'm losing my words, but it was just, it was just so focused on the upper crustness of teaching plants and horticulture and all of that without mm -hmm. taking into account the lives and the background to every uh, to each participant that time on rikers was eye awakening obviously and it made me like think like fuck plants <laughs> mm. like what the hell are we doing mm -hmm. what the hell is happening here and i think that's just like nonprofits, like in general right like they're just you know making money off like oppressed peoples and I guess thinking that they're helping, but like everything, it's just like a band-aid or some sort of, which I have many thoughts on that and we can rant about that later or whatever. But um, yeah, meeting Jess and Zakaya was great because I feel like we did have these discussions. We did talk about all of these things about what we were seeing and we were just like, we got to do things differently. Like I, I, I love horticulture. I love plants. I want to do something different. And it, it's unfortunate that this organization has even access to these people, the privilege to be around these people who are incarcerated because they literally could be doing, they're just doing, I feel like more harm than good. Well, it was often treated like a, like a, like a work detail. Work first, garden second, guinea hens third, participants somewhere after that. Absolutely. We got tired of listening to their ass. So we did our own damn thing. Very true. Very true. Yeah. That's, that's the gist of it. Yeah. When we were all, you know, still working for this organization and trying to leave meetings early and get together with each other and <laughs> make plans, um, the original thing we were trying we were trying to build was a uh, an alternative to incarceration, an ATI, I think, and imagining what could a, a program look like that, you know, would keep people from getting sent to Rikers. When we were on the island and we were coming up with like different ideas, like one was like, oh, like what if we grew food? I don't know, we were just like, let's, let's get it out to families or let's like think mm -hmm. about food that can be like sent up stay and you know i was getting like in inspired by like different groups who were trying to like have more contact with people who were incarcerated up say like i think the alternative to incarceration like was the like first idea but it was no longer like what defined like what we wanted to do because at the end of the day like it is like still like in a form of incarceration it is a band-aid even the csa like so so the csa the friendly csa came about like it really took off over pandemic and alongside the friendly commissary fund which we raise money every other month uh to send to people on rikers and upstate and that's how at first we were actually that was like the first project we did was the commissary fund then decided okay like this is like great to support people who are on Rikers I was like we also had former students that we had kept in touch with and we're like we let's support people who are inside like also we know commissary is important but we also know that commissary is expensive and like they also don't have many options so like let's send food if we can and try to jump through all these hoops at the DOC puts in place so that people can't access anything. We wanted for people to have like choice, like the power of choice. And like, we didn't just want to like, it would have been so much easier to be like, we're just going to like put together a box and send that to people. But if there's one thing I learned about working on Rikers is that not everyone loves vegetables. And I certainly don't love vegetables either, but I do know that there's an importance of like, let's, let's mm -hmm. let people choose that. Mm -hmm. 
if they want it and how how much of that it's very tricky because we have to be very clear in our form that like if people are going to receive a package they can get it but it will affect it will like go towards the pound limit because everyone who's incarcerated upstate has a 35 pound limit we want people to have to be able to get the package but we also don't want it to interrupt anything with people's families and that's why choice is so important and we want people to make that decision for themselves whether if they want it one month they don't want it the next month and the choices that they want so we send the newsletter out every month so it usually goes out the in the first week of the month as close to the beginning as we can get it and it always includes like you know there's always like an introduction letter that's just like you know us saying hi and you know what's what's going on what's like an interesting seasonal happening or event or i don't know current event or something and then we always highlight uh one of the choices you know say one of the choices was potatoes then there's you know an introduction to potatoes like what are potatoes like when what what part of the plant are you eating and then there's a little more kind of like gardening info on it like when do you plant them how long do they take to grow like what is a seed potato why why don't we plant potatoes from an actual an actual seed when do you harvest them how do you store them all that good information and then we include a recipe because it's just like not only is it like multiple of the ingredients but it's like usually a recipe that doesn't isn't complicated like you know you don't need like a ton of cooking equipment or like stove top and soon we're gonna get the quarterly newsletter out it's called yard talk and and the the intention behind it is to have more stories people's uh stories shared and maybe a little less about food but you know just focusing on members and participants and their experiences and whatever they like to share with um, with other folks who are going to be reading that quarterly newsletter. It would be really awesome to get people's voices. I mean, we've, we've talked about a lot about like getting maybe like a recipe like zine out or like getting a lot of like more feedback with cooking stuff on the internet because we we do get a lot of um, we do get feedback saying like, a lot of people like love to share like food and then they share meals together like the csa boxes they get like super excited and share it with others who are not getting the csa and it's just like really great to hear that there's just like community being built around a healthy meal or whatever or not a healthy meal but just some good food and yeah i'd love to just like know more about like what they're cooking or and maybe if they want to share that with other people or not we we want to also include more resources with other like organizations who are doing mm -hmm. that work inside out work this the csa and the commissary are our main two projects um at the moment so we're still going to focus on those so a lot of a lot of what's like what we took from Rikers was like a lot of like friendships or like acquaintances that we made on the inside and who we um, wanted to continue to be in communication with if they of course wanted to and because of that I feel like there is a lot of like thinking about um, yeah like what you would do for your friend like right like support them in whatever way and we were like before CSA or like outside of Roots and Bound, um, we were going upstate to visit some of these uh, former students that we had just to bring them packages or, and we're still in touch with them and all of that. But I think it is um, important to keep communication with people on the inside. Also knowing like how to better support people inside with the feedback that's given. You know, something that I can recall, you know, people like a, a fear or common thing is you know, being like forgotten, being able to kind of 
continue to show up for people that we've built relationships with um, and friendships, I think, in some cases with. Kale, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Kale, yeah. It's nice to get together and, like, really, like, get to continue, like, the love to share that love of horticulture and like growing stuff and like just being like kind of planty nerds you know doing something you love and then also just like hoping that that love is then shared further inside through like csa or commissary and whatever the covid rates inside at least some of the women's facilities have been really really bad like just people on full-on quarantine and i don't know it's it's so hard I, a lot of times you just feel like sometimes a little hopeless but um i feel like like a lot of the foods we send are obviously they're vegetables they all have like very like nourishing properties and whatever but i think we just wanted to make something that was like like uh, honey and like ginger and garlic and something that they can like concoct and um we put tea in there but tea and like cough drops or anything that's like that that like even like says herbal or medicinal on the box will be like thrown away like it will not mm -hmm. be accepted by the doc so it's very like sometimes we'll take chances and we'll try to send stuff in and either stuff will get sent back to us or the person will never receive like the person won't receive that one thing but they'll receive everything else i guess for every month we we do seasonal stuff of course but we'll throw in like fun special option that's also seasonal in the sense that like if it's like holiday related or whatever but for like december i think we included like the option of cookies as a treat and someone was like um, I want five pounds of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> Nothing else. Just send me the cookies. Like, and they wrote it. Just like, like lots of cookies, please. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Just stuffed a box full of like, whatever cookies box packaging is allowed because they're very particular about that too. So that was fun. It's such a bummer that we can't send food to folks inside Rikers. Cause like, I, I mean, I'm just thinking about like the situation going on right now. And right, right now folks are allowed one piece of fruit a day. And most times that fruit is rotten. The food can be, you know, a hug of sorts, you know, like, hey, we see you and we acknowledge that you're in there. And, and you know, we like, it, it, I mean, it's like Pam said, I mean, we're, we're not necessarily solving anything, but like this, just some fucking kindness and, and acknowledging that, that people are there. It's an acknowledgement. When we were teaching on Rikers, we thought about this often about how you know, this nonprofit, you know, they're just like, oh, we do all this healing work, horticultural therapy, and like the garden. And listen, there is no denying that our students like loved being outside, like in the garden, some of them, not all of them, but they like enjoyed it. And there was something beautiful and relaxing. And like, there was something great for them. But all of that got erased the minute they stepped back into that jail. Like, just completely erased i mean that there is no healing done really i mean the system the system is so violent i mean it was all undone so and i i think I, we thought about that a lot and i think with this i think when i think about friendly csa you know what we're doing isn't i mean i wish i wish there was like no prisons right but if there's there are prisons now I wish they had at least healthier, like access to healthier food that wasn't like $4 for a small head of broccoli. And I think CSA isn't meant to be like, oh, we're going to like, I don't know, we're not, we're, we're we aren't going to like solve anything. I mean, I think the idea is just to like 
support people while we can make sure people like remember that like give them the opportunity of to have some choice and to have options and to have a something else but we know it's not like the solution or anything and and we know that if the doc got like fresh organic vegetables tomorrow that we still would want the prisons not to exist and we still know that it'll Mm -hmm. still be violent you know just just how we uh, we oppose all the new jails that they want to build in the city we oppose rikers and we oppose the new jails i was led to abolition through the program where i met jess and pam going going to the island whenever we had classes and just seeing what the hell was going on the treatment of people and i was like i was like this 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 shit don't make sense this is not i, I don't know i just i just believed in there has to be another way to to support people there just has to be another way that was what fed me and, and led me deeper into this 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 future of of abolition and abolition has been like more of i feel that word didn't really mean anything to me many years ago when I was like younger and like doing a lot of like earth first like letter writing supporting like eco activists and I think that that word wasn't in my vocabulary but I understood it already I understood that the systems in place were not working and I understood it, I think, for, like, right, these people that I definitely looked up to for doing such radical work. But it wasn't until I started working on Rikers Island where it further radicalized me to see that this system really is, like, does not work. It should be abolished. It affects everyone, literally everyone. And that, I think was truly eye awakening. And then there was this whole movement of like abolition and, you know, Miriam Kaba was like a big person who taught me and many other people have taught me so much about it. But yeah, I think definitely just being in like radical circles also has definitely uh, paved this, this path to abolition. You know, when you know, when you know words, like the definition of a word, but you don't know it. Like you, 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 you have an idea of what it of what it is. But then, you know, when you're so kind of confronted with a situation and and you you come face to face with what it is, that word becomes real, and then and you start to really feel the meaning of it. And I and I think I didn't really like understand our carceral system. And I didn't really understand what abolition was or could look like, you know, until people that you came into contact with, you know, made it seem real and made it seem possible and and made it seem like a large thing that was kind of changing in people's minds. Just even thinking about like all these mutual aid groups and like, obviously, we were just trying to like care for each other and and not forget about our community and I think it's the same for like sending people food inside and talking to people inside and that's why all these letter writing groups are so important because keeping in touch with people inside is so important we just do it in a way that's more like here's some vegetables (laughs) if you want them (laughs) um but we know it's not like the answer and it's not gonna like save anything but we we hope in the meantime to fight for it actual liberation. Keep your gorilla gardening going.
Hmm. <laughs> you ready? Yes, I'm, I'm ready. Let, let's go for it. Okay. Into the world of disturbance <laughs> or redisturbance, right? <laughs> World of Disturbance and Redisturbance, a conversation. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ellie, and this is Andrea. We're here to discuss and feel and move through themes of natural cultural disturbance. In just a moment, we're going to invite you to confront and process disturbance by moving with us. Thanks so much, Ellie, to open us up into the world of disturbance and redisturbance. And with that, hearing everybody's here and we see you, you are here, let's ground ourselves for a second. And just feel like your whole body mass just sinking into the floor. You maybe sink into your chair. And then even your breath maybe takes you further down into your feet and notice how your feet touching the ground with your whole body mass just pouring into the floor and how the floor comes up to you and the floor goes further down into the next floor until to the soil and you just both touching each other this idea in between of this energy. And let's just take a breath there of landing and thinking what land are you are on and what this means to you. Now we have a five minute video to share with you, inviting you to move together with us.
Thanks for moving with me, Andrea. Thanks, Ellie, for moving with me. And thanks for everybody else that is here moving with us. Yes. The imagery that we just experienced together is drawn from our divergent and intersecting engagements with land disturbance. Over the last year, Andrea has been witnessing and caring for attempts at land defense on Lenape land of Manhattan, uh, land currently known as East River Park in current day New York City. Here, a group of community members defend the lives of a thousand mature trees and the many diverse living beings who live with them on this land, sandwiched between the highway and the shoreline asking for flood protection that is in partnership with the trees in the land. They resist an act of violence that destroys every living being on this 50 acres of parkland, which has grown and matured in the more than 80 years since it was built on landfill in 1939. Yeah. And while you, Ellie, has been working with turf grass monoculture, um, Akalons, right? Um, on the Mohican lands of currently now Troy, New York, um, as part of the long re disturbance um, laboratory. Um, you're removing like one by one meter square feet of this lawn to create these public sculptures that are shaped and sculpted by weedy disturbance oriented plants, right? Um, and this, this project um, really imagines and enacts this unlearning experience to create opportunities for building um, plant human solidarity in disturbed urban, suburban, and ex-urban habitats. And just, just this two opposition that we we playing in it um, is really very striking um, to me. Yeah, that's what brought us to the theme of disturbance and working through it together. And um, we thought one way we could guide ourselves in talking about this because so much of it is so physical and so grounded and translating it onto the screen is, is challenging. Um, would be to guide ourselves through investigating, breathing, and moving through a range of definitions of disturbance. So starting with words, but um, translating some of their definitions into other ways of communicating. Um, so we'll start with one drawn from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. <laughs> uh, so disturbance is the act of disturbing someone or something. The act of disturbance, someone or something. What is for you someone and what is something really occurs me thinking about the park when they just came in and take everything and it was more a something. And for us defenders, um, it is someone is subjective. It has a living and has a being. Yeah, um, for sure. In that very first definition, I see that binary that there are beings in this world that are things, that are objects. And there are those that are someones <laughs> that are infused with agency in life. And I think um, one of the things that we're both thinking about is the someoneness of so many of the things that we're surrounded by, creatures, plants, soil. Yeah. And then, yeah, and with that, I'm just thinking also when the someone is even like 
in the process of composing and changing, right? This one slice of one of the tree that they cut that was just left over and it inviting itself and taking it home and over time it changes. That cut wasn't there first. And over time in being in here in the air, it changes. And it's even that state of composing, right? The state of decomposing, like is there, what is there that change? Is that also considered a change of disturbance? It goes into another place, right? Yep. There's a lot more parts to this. Merriam-Webster definition. Um, the next one is the state of being disturbed. <sighs> yeah, that my heart feels that one. <laughs> Your heart feels that one. Um, that my heart feels that. that one. Yeah, yeah um, I have to say, completely. in in I mean, you know, you it's like a heartbreak, like you know that the state of disturbance somebody happens to you traumatically, and it totally inside disturbs you. But from towards um, ecological thing, towards land and towards tree, this this is river park. This disturbance, violence on this on this land is the first time that I explored it so deeply on that level. I explored it before on a human level, mm -hmm. but on, on the state of disturbance, on literally on that level, um, it's very intense. And it, and it just always brings me right, like how it is for people even, I didn't live in the park, right? I'm not, this is not, I'm around the park. I started to know the park, right? What is it if it's all your livelihood? And maybe it is our all livelihood, but it brings me to other places like in the Amazon and all these places where, where everything gets taken and how much, and what kind of healing does it need when you get experience that's disturbing? So I, and that was so that coming to that, I was then such thinking this caring and tending that you have in your lawn square and that hope in yeah. that when then this very different plants coming like instead two like lawn and two other plants there's suddenly this 10 15 plants mm -hmm. and there is this hope of living and diversity to me yeah yeah they're both acts of disturbance and i think that's what drew us to having this conversation and putting these images together that i don't think we would have thought to put together otherwise no. and mm -hmm. um in terms of like the heartbreak, I think I'm responding to these lawns, which have been breaking my heart for 20 years <laughs> with their <laughs> insistence of um, this kind of monoculture blankness that coats the land and this kind of uh, mockery of an ecosystem. <laughs> and that there's some relief for me in that long running heartache. I feel that um, to like take this tool and push it into the turf That's and acknowledge right. this is the living system and then do that movement. Yeah. And you exactly. hear the ripping and pulling, you feel the resistance of the turf. It wants to stay there. It is alive. We acknowledge that when we disturb something, whether it's done with care and intention or it's done treating the land as a thing, as we talked about with that first definition, someone or something. Exactly. Disturbed. But and that, I think I am in a state of disturbance when I do it, <laughs> and I work through some of that. Um, and that's part of what this movement that we were trying to do in the beginning with this video, I think <laughs> really just feeling like this driving beat and these images coming together was somehow productive for us for working through that heartache. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then the other disturbance also being a disturbance. I may, I'm not sure if you are already on that definition. We'll come to a de definition that gets to that, I think. Let's, let's, so we, let's get to that definition because, you know, that... that yeah, so we'll right get a few other examples from yeah. definition one in Merriam-Webster because if we skip to definition two, 
we see that we come to noisy or violent activity, commotion, as in all caps. And I'm not sure if that's maybe what you were thinking about. <laughs> Well, actually, I can put it in that way. We became we defender because, you know, we will be in uh, in front of the gates, right? Before they put yeah. the gate up the first day. And it's actually literally three months where this first time happens, right? And so they wanted to put the gate up and we just sit on that line where the gates were coming up. And we sit it the whole day and the police come in and we had to move, right? And some got arrested. But then we consistently, you know, would show up every day. And always Maybe like, disturbance. <laughs> and yeah, always tell them and, and like, this, stop it. And then also we were crying, right? When that the tree in, in the middle of the, when you hear that sound, actually that was, this is real. That was real that when that tree came down, it just came out of our body, but we were everyday present, right? Witnessing and repressed. So we became actually for them that disturbance. And, yeah. and, and after two months, it helped us at least, and it's not on, on one section that they will take later on away, we were able to hold back them a little, that they didn't took everything yet. And so, but it was interesting. They even say to us, you are really in our way, you're disturbing our work. And so I was like- I was What's here. the work? Whose labor? <laughs> yeah, so our own body, being just present and watching and witnessing and just asking them, you know, you ha we have to find another way. We cannot just kill everything for flood protection. We need to recognize that they have already knowledge as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can pause. Mm -hmm and just breathe with that a little while um, with the knowledge of whew, the plant beings that are around us all the time who we breathe with, yeah. even when we're inside. Mm -hmm. <sighs> And I'll come back to another part of the Merriam-Webster definition, which is um, a departure from a norm or standard, a deviation, disruption, or impairment in form, function, or activity such as sleep disturbances or endocrine disturbances. Which of course relates to what you were just talking about in terms of the norms of the folks carrying out the work, which they considered work and you consider ecocide, right? Mm -hmm. um, their norm is to be able to go and do that work without someone there keening for the death of the ecosystem, for the death of these trees, right? So that aberration, that disruption, that's, it's commotion, but it's also a disturbance because it's outside the norm. We don't in Western settler colonial societies, um, contemporary at least, have a process for mourning for grieving the death of a tree, right? I mean, we do, we do, you do it, I do it. I know other people who do it, but we don't, there's a cultural amnesia about how to deal with that. Yeah, and then with that, I was hearing too, like like the workers, right? And the workers came, right? And they had to do, but we were very clearly before we even blocked, we had always acknowledged first as a group, acknowledge in a tune. And then we tell always the worker, this is not about you. We are respecting your work. We honoring that the queue, you coming in the morning, you taking the train or the, or the car, you coming from another neighborhood, New Jersey, you coming to hear the work, you do your work. So you make your salary so you can go home and feed your thing. So we're not doing this to interrupt you 
but we're doing this to interrupt the overall. So we were very clearly, and so we got this relationship between the workers, right? Because we say them, and some worker even told us, I wish they didn't need to do it, but this is my job. Yep. And, and so there is always between the people and then it's also the tree, right? And, and I did, and maybe, thinking about what you were reading in the end. It's like these little cards we made once. As you see here is all the trees when they were still there at the amphitheater. And it says here, um, walk to the hill of the East River Park amphitheater, destruction to be present with the oak tree elders. Mm -hmm. And so it, the idea was like to give these cards to everybody to go there. And then it was no time anymore like at that time, overnight, the next day, they, when we went there, why right then they cut the whole thing. But then the branches were gone and we were still reading it. And wow. so maybe I can just read it right now because it goes yeah. really with what you mentioned. And it's titled, Oak Tree Elders Heartbeat Dance. Sawdust of violence in the air. Hurry to the oak tree elder sacred groove that fell into the hands of politicians. Linger, fence don't stop touch. We see you, hear our long histories. Move the heartbeat, scan from the root to the crown, skyward. Let the pulse flow into you. Improvise with us, wounded, rooted, calm sawdust of generations in the air hmm. that makes me think about a lot of things but one thing it makes me think about is um when there is this kind of disturbance and maybe it takes me to another definition um the the way that feels most grounding for those beings who are lost in the disturbance mm -hmm. to continue on to be part of a cycle right so you're talking about sawdust and I'm thinking yeah. about how those branches are getting hauled away right they're yes. disappearing into the mulch factory and we don't know where they're going to get up, end up interred um, and they're not getting to go back to the land that grew them um which makes me think about kind of scales of disturbance. And um, when, when we work with the lawn um, removal, we end up with turf. I've got a box of turf right here um, that should be composted, right? I mean, we want yes. this to go back into the cycle. And uh, when, when we do the turf disturbances, we try to send it back into the cycle as close as possible to where it came from. So often with lawns, they're not getting nutrition that's from their local ecosystem. They're getting it trucked in. We've got this bag that was founded from a surf builder, a yes. owner of the house that I'm staying in right now uh -huh. that's a turf builder. It's, you know, you put all these inputs into lawns and then you just chop them down constantly and you throw that stuff somewhere else. And so you're not enriching the land. Um, and just mourning for those oak trees and wishing they could return to the land that grew them, <laughs> if nothing else. Obviously, we want them alive still, but that level, we're so disturbed that we can't even inter these elder oaks back where they, because we're changing the land so much, the land isn't there to receive them anymore. It's just, it's a well, whole other level. It's also yeah. money making, right? They yeah. say, like, if you think about the tree stumps, right? that you know when they took these big trees they could stay there and as we know tree stumps were dying off they become this huge ecosystem right remember moss is on it on the bark and yeah, then no, it's mushrooms coming essential, and all insects, right? right yeah and not one that could live there and we asked yeah. them just leave a few at least where is their presence and let the the and then they always say oh we bring this new new young little trees in and it's like they have no knowledge they need to do with no knowledge of an elder helping them they have no land that they can help them because yeah. these trees like when i look at these rings and i'm not sure if you guys seeing in here you see these spots here like there's this one spot here here 
here, here. It goes all the way around these dark little spots. And yeah. when I counted the rings from here to here, that's exactly where Sandy was. So it shows this tree was stressed in Sandy, right? It has marks, but it was healing. You can see it stopped after um, a, a, um, after two years. It stopped and started to heal. So this tree, each ring has knowledge, right? Has knowledge of the soil, has knowledge of the um, surrounding. And you're not giving this to young trees that come in there. Yeah. Mm. I breathe with that, certainly. And we know that disturbance is an essential part of ecosystems but the way that disturbance happens and how it gets integrated um, really matters. So that kind of makes me think about, um, hmm. Yeah, just coming with that one, uh, it made me think about, it always makes me think about in disturbance in the word itself, if it take the middle part out, if it take out IS2URB, I get to dance. Yeah. And, and I really like that because, you know, dance is all about change. And a lot of times, special in certain dance, you're looking for new patterns, how to organize yeah. yourself, right? So it is also, as you say, it's a natural thing, but how we addressing and, and when, in what way, what is that? That's what matters, right? Yeah. If you want a, a life that thrives for people, human beings, everybody around, right? Yeah, we know there's not stasis in ecosystems, and that's part of what's so disturbing about lawns is they are these eternally maintained monocultures that are supposed to look like a green rug year round, ideally. Um, yeah, and when I was sitting on that. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. Just sorry. Oh, just the, that's why it's a redisturbance because it's already disturbed, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was going to read the, de the definition of disturbance that's more particular to the dominant Western sciences. Um, okay, let's hear it, let's hear it. <laughs> yeah, so this is according to Tepley et al, who are writing in the Berkshire Encyclopedia of Sustainability, but this definition mm -hmm. is fairly related to a lot that I've seen in these kind of de um, dictionaries of ecology uh -huh. or biology. Um, so disturbances are relatively discrete events in time that substantially influence ecosystem composition, structure, and function. Natural disturbances, so-called, such as hurricanes, avalanches, fires, and floods, play important roles in shaping landscapes and the biota that evolved with them. With increasing human population growth and resource demand, the direct and indirect effects of human caused, put that in quotes because we know not all humans are responsible at the same level for <laughs> disturbances. Um, human caused disturbances are posing an increasingly complex challenge for balancing ecosystem and societal needs, which I would argue aren't separate at all. And we can't possibly try to balance no. so-called ecosystem needs when separate from society needs. But um, that's part of what brought me to the in an interest in disturbance is that there are these disturbance oriented plants who know how to heal wounds and they jump right into action and they're the ones that prepare this bare soil that we saw evidence of as you were sitting on that park bench. They're the ones who prepare that soil so it doesn't wash away into the river and then hopefully the acorns that the squirrels work so hard to bury <laughs> might be able to sprout again someday and build another oak forest. Um, but that would be if the plans for how the park is going to be manicured and maintained um, allow for that, which it seems they won't. No, and, and it always makes me also think of coming um, two things. One thing is how to talk about it, and they always talk about function. And, you know, we're talking in the world, in the Western world, a lot about function. You don't talk much about the expression, like mm -hmm. how they express themselves. What is there? And that, because once we use the word expression, it becomes much more alive. 
And function, mm -hmm. we can ask distance ourselves, right? That's one thing that across my mind, even hearing that definition. And the other one is when I was sitting on that broken bench, right? I did was thinking like, what would happen if we could stop them that they reevaluate this whole project? No work would happen anymore. Nothing they would allow to be touched. Who will come back? And since they dig everything up, right? Like, you know, that, you know, what seeds are now on the top that were below? We know this is landfill. This is 80 year old soil. That soil, some of the soil came from somewhere, which I was reading somewhere, I think from New Jersey and other places. So could there be a potential a plant even come? I like to imagine a plant would come that we had no idea it could come again. Like that even would go in extinction. Meanwhile, I would like to think horse of it will come that I know loves be the emergency plant that always shows up in the first two years before it turns around, right? Maybe that's a good way to move out of this conversation is, you know, these little pieces of lawn that I'm, giving the opportunity to sculpt in just a meter by meter square, maybe we can envision that for that wounded land that you were walking through that's just so hard to hold in your mind. I'm wondering oh, just to envision it, getting the chance to repair itself from where it is right now and what would that look like? I mean, it's hard. I wouldn't want to wish that on that land. It doesn't, don't, no land deserves to try to re recover from that, that kind of compaction, that kind of pillaging, um, but what would it look like? We would look at, and, but I think one thing you said, allowing the repair, if you mm -hmm. even could find, if that violence happens, can we allow the repair? And I think that's why sometimes some of us sneaking into the fences and we bringing things or stay with the land. When I, you know, when I went in there, find a way how to get in and just be on that tree stump, just to recognize and witness it does repairing itself, but then it gets disturbed again, right? Right now it's in the process of repairing, but then unfortunately they will come in again because they have their idea because they're not finished and need to make the pipe. And maybe just thinking about since spring is coming soon, mm -hmm. everybody that listens in and us, thinking maybe just disrepairing things coming up and mm -hmm. what 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 that means and let it just sit it there and we'll just do a few. Hi, Ellie. Bye, Andrea. Thanks so much Thanks for the conversation. For, Thanks for talking about disturbance with me. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my poem for Gorilla Grafters. With so many mics on mute. We are screaming, the winds are screaming, our hearts are screaming. Despite being sheltered in this old house without much insulation, we feel the luxury of our perceived safety in this present moment. While floods inundate, while lips are parched, while smoke chokes, where, while missiles rain, we are screaming, the winds are screaming, our hearts are screaming. Epigenetic fallout from this cascade of traumas. Extreme weather appears to be perverse titillation from a distance. 
while we drink our morning tea and write a poem, a lament in a minor key that may or may not be heard. We are screaming, the winds are screaming, our hearts are screaming. Walking slowly, we can hug old trees, grabbing thick bark for wisdom and redemption. As we dodge the bullets of this time, we know that all of us are in the line of fire and the game is rigged for those who go down first. We are screaming, the winds are screaming, our hearts are screaming. The howl of the wind continues like a dirge, but we can still feel our breath like that one tiny miracle. And with it, we hold a million possibilities. Thank you. Beverly Natus signing out from the unceded traditional lands of the Puyallup people in Tacoma, Washington. I will say that plants are carnivores. They like to eat vegetable matter and they like to eat meat, but they wait for the meat to die and they don't hunt. They, they do hunt, they hunt by waiting. Yeah. You need a hat. Yeah. So the idea is that uh, you can select some <laughs> sweets that you want. We have uh, lentils, fennel, fenugreek, uh, onion, dill, and some uh, mystery seeds. <laughs> really, we're gonna come up with our own formula. We're all we're all young scientists here, right? So your formula. For so the most part, it was like mostly clay, and then some soil or manure, and then some seed. Yeah, just don't overestimate the amount of seed that you put in. It's about one tenth. We have to get the clay and the soil mixed, and so what we're going to do is um, open some of these and cut them into some soil, and add some water, and then we're going to take off our shoes. And, right. Once it's once we have the right consistency and we add some seeds, we can then sculpt for a while, just like ceramics class. It's a garret. Yeah, who's good at cutting clay? Oh yeah, I forgot to say, uh, gloves are optional. We do have gloves down there. Another thing, how many people here are vegetarian? You're a vegetarian, sort of. Yes. Okay, so this this stuff is um optional but you can add it later to your clay when you're sculpting so that the vegetarians don't have to deal with this. Now, I will say that plants are carnivores. They like to eat vegetable matter and they like to eat meat but they wait for the meat to die and they don't hunt. They, they do hunt, they hunt by waiting. Yeah? So this is these are boxes of gross, right? But uh, actually the seeds like it. Maybe it's too late. Oh. There we go. It's a siphon thing. We're gonna need more water, I can tell you that. Sorry, get some buckets. Yeah. Oh, Susa found buckets. Ask her where they are. Oh, they were standing up there. 
Yeah. Yeah, bring some water. What is it? Well, yeah. How easy this could be. Okay, this is a really quick example. It's called, I made a bio art sandwich. Okay, this is our first eco art sculpture. We're adding a little dill, about 10%. There. Oh! That was easy. Yeah. If you put on some gloves, you can squish it up. What you like? Yeah. It goes like this. Look, Regine, sculpting is like this. They won't get. Okay, who wants to make a sculpture? So before you sculpt, you want to mix seeds in, yeah. Mm. Okay, you guys want to make a sculpture? I'll give you a shovel. There's gloves over there. Okay, who wants a plate? If you ask the pretty girls with the shovel, okay. they will shovel you some. And you, you can park your bike and put on gloves. And then what, why, what is it for? What well, we're going we're gonna to take them and smush the sculpture. When you're done with the sculpture, you mush it into this building. Hij is wel een beetje groot om tegen gebouwen aan te smijten. Ja, Because we need to make room for artists. So you, all of you are gardeners? Or, or what? No, 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 we are not gardeners. We are, everybody is a gardener. You don't have to be in class to do it. Yeah, please show, please show. Je kan ook nog een decoratief laagje met andere zaadjes maken. Oh, en gezichtjes en zo. Gezichtjes. Misschien wat wiet. Ja, ik kan ook nog dat door. Er is zo meer. Je kunt just zien wat. Zo, bij What's that? Oh, yeah. It's worth each long verpen. That's what it's called. Vertel meer. <laughs> nou, misschien iets visachtigs. Of een spermatoïde. 
Uh, probably the best mix is between my toes. <laughs> There you go, Jeanette. Here's a photo op. Oh, nice. Soon you're not coming in? No. <laughs> What's up, man? <laughs> this is not how you garden? Yeah, I'll do it with my hand. <laughs> okay. Ik schrijf over wat ik zie. Vooral over hoe mensen, hoe mensen reageren. Iemand kan vragen of de vrij gezellig feest was. Dat vond ik wel een raken. Maar sexy is wel zaadballen, hè? Ja, zeker met blote voeten. Uh, Bionieuws heet het. Vakblad voor biologen. Sustainability into extra, extra innings. Mm. They're full of seeds. Yeah, so when you spread the mud, it goes into the city and you get flowers everywhere. That's the idea. If you want, you can join in. <laughs> Nou ja, dat doen ze. Dat heeft ook met de zaden te maken, toch? Dat heeft met de zaden te maken. Ja, als je ze warm neerzet met op een, in een vochtige plaats, dan denk ik dat het drie okay. tot zes weken duurt. Nou, we gaan ze nu verspreiden, dus warm en vochtig. Ja. Daar moeten we op letten. Ja. Nou, gaan we daarop letten. <laughs> dus als u binnenkort iets in de omgeving ziet... Dat zaad, hè? Die zaadballen. <laughs> ja, die zaadballen. Warm en vochtig. <laughs> Ken je het verhaal van het mosterdzaadje uit de Bijbel? Nou ja, één mosterdzaadje, heel kasteel. Plat, ja. De kracht. Nou, een mosterdzaadje, dat kan het voor schade aanrichten. Een grote koning die uh, zei: uh, Mij gebeurt er niks. En uh, iemand uh, plant één mosterdzaadje en wacht het 200 jaar. First we walk around the bog a little looking for yeah. places. Get the camera lady. Hey, look at the ball. Bitter ball. It's bitter ball in, right? Ik kan niet zo heel goed mikken hoor. Maar ik ga het proberen op zijn kont. Jee!
Oh, there's planters. Oh. Yeah. You're gonna get the planters. Kind of sensual, huh? Like smushing it in. Oh shit! Perfect. Get Barbara. There she is. Get her. Allemaal op die manier ontstaan. Dus dat doen wij nu ook, zeg maar. Deze zijn Delicate, delicate. Oh, more. I think I'm more expressionist than that even. I'm just flicking. <laughs> it's a lot of flicking, I think. I'll flicker, flicker. Oh my god. Ja, want ze zagen mij met zo'n ding. Ja, er hangen camera's boven, dus het is gewoon vastgelegd. Maar dat maakt verder niet. Ik weet toch niet in de gevangenis. Ik weet niet wat er voor een straf staat op het verspreiden van zaad. <laughs> We zijn bezig met een um, soort van guerrilla gardening, seed broadcasting, broadcasting, public seed broadcasting. Dat is georganiseerd door Adam Zaretsky. En uh, Adam uh, woont in Woodstock, 
New York State, de Verenigde Staten, is een tijd lang bij Waag Society Artists in Residence. Uh, is bezig met zijn um, PhD Artistic Research bij Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, ook in New York. En uh, hij is bezig met biokunsten, of gewoon dat een uh, genre is dat eigenlijk niet bestaat. Want er is heel veel discussie over wat nou biokunst is. Hij is... We zitten een beetje in, de, in dezelfde hoek als Eduardo Katsch, of schoon die daar ook heel veel discussie mee heeft of Eduardo Katsch nou hele integere kunst maakt. Voor het lichtgevende konijn Alba bijvoorbeeld zegt Eduardo Katsch nooit een konijn kwaad te hebben gedaan, Alba zelf niet, maar er zijn wel meerdere honderden in het laboratorium uh, ja, wel hard, hard aangepakt omdat ze... Uh, opengesneden moesten worden, onbevrucht te worden, uh, omdat ze soms niet lichtgevend genoeg waren, et cetera. Uh, Adam is een beetje een soort van uh, opvolger van, van het werk van Joe Davis. Uh, hij noemt zijn eigen kunst niet biokunst, maar vivo arts, vivo arts, alle kunstvormen waarbij levende organismes uh, in het tentoon te stellen object zitten. En... Uh, wat hij daar eigenlijk allemaal mee wil is um, biotechnologie, biologie gebruiken als materiaal om kunst te maken. En biotechnologie niet alleen voor te behouden aan de militaire industrie, de defensieindustrie, de medische industrie of um, de landbouw. Als, als die sectoren van biotechnologie gebruik mogen maken, waarom zou kunst dat dan niet mogen? Dat is een beetje een, een startpunt van waaruit hij allemaal zijn dingen doet. En um, ja, wat is de betekenis daarvan? De betekenis is ook om debat te genereren waar, waardoor mensen zich bewuster worden van het feit dat we in een hoogtechnologische maatschappij leven. Maar ook om te kijken wat nou de grenzen van kunst zijn. En nou, misschien interesseert hem dat nog niet eens zo, maar um, het feit is wel dat het wetenschap als materie voor kunst neemt. En uh, wij doen het bij de Waag omdat we uh, het interessant vinden om te kijken hoe dit soort technologieën, als gewoon hier met public seed broadcasting, een hele simpele vorm van gebruiken die min of meer een sim symbool staat voor hoe gemakkelijk je genetisch gemodificeerde organismen in de publieke ruimte kan verspreiden. We werken er bij Waag Society mee omdat het ook weer een manier is om te laten zien hoe je technologie naar het publieke domein kan brengen. En um, als je kijkt naar de, 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 de kerndoelstelling van Waag Society, um, creatieve technologie voor culturele, culturele en maatschappelijke innovatie, dan is dit um, nou, daar echt wel een voorbeeld van, hoe we daarmee bezig zijn. En ook, net als internet een heleboel technologie gedemocratiseerd heeft, uh, is ook... Um, biotechnologie ze gaan het democratiseren. Vroeger had Greg Venter uh, een enorme supercomputer nodig om het menselijk genoom uit te rekenen. Daar is tegenwoordig al niet meer zo'n hele zware computer voor nodig. En ook niet meer zoveel rekentijd. Volgende week vertel ik het volgende deel. In the spring of 2020, many of us felt we were in a new stage of radical breakdown. Trump was president, the pandemic was beginning, the climate warmed, and police violence continued unabated. 
We found ourselves pooling our rotten food scraps together and kicking leaves into a pile. Suddenly, the pile was heating up and breaking down in familiar and unfamiliar ways. Before we knew it, we were calling our friends and neighbors, asking them to join us for compost flips where we also could flip out a little and flip out together. We started trolling the sides of the roads for sources of carbon, such as big piles of dried leaves and grass. We started analyzing our neighbors' eating habits through their refuse and dreaming of better soil for all. Hot compost combines core body strengthening exercises with the contemplation of rapid and radical decomposition, transformation, and the poetics of the rotten. Hot compost is a collaboration between Elodie Forquette, Bryn Hatton, Margareta Howitt, Don Waleski, and many composters and compost enthusiasts throughout the village of Hamilton, New York, and beyond. Compost piles occurred at multiple sites throughout Madison County. Hot compost took the form as a durational event on November 3, 2020, the date of the U.S. presidential elections. For 12 hours, Hot Compost live-streamed compost flips, compost giveaways, conversations, and deep compost analysis. It kept the compost community sane amidst the insanity of our national discourse. For Grafters Exchange, Hot Compost shares some momentous flip events, curbside carbon collection, and other highlights from 2020.
Hello, my name is Astrid Brown Farley, and this poem is called Heart Rot. The path is mine to follow, the hollows of the earth, her every hill and fallow is mine by right of birth, born free as the high flying swallow. Why should I not know my worth and roll like the god Apollo on the wind that calls me forth to worry the wavy green willow, the ashes piled in the hearth, rattle the branches and bellow, shake the bells in the church, the fields of barley and mallow, the trees of laburnum and birch, the cage of my dark winged fellow, the one I left in the lurch, who sways with the leaves turning yellow in the shadow of a lantern-led search. We wade well up from the shallows, we laugh with unholy mirth. There is no land here to hallow, whether oak and ironwood growth, were shaded shelter or gallows, when they fall they shall bury us both. Thank you. Age of Plastic by Craig Santos Paris. The doctor presses the plastic probe against my pregnant wife's belly. Plastic leeches estrogenic and toxic chemicals. Ultrasound waves pulse between plastic tissue, fluid, and bone until the embryo echoes. Plastic makes this possible. My wife labors at home in an inflatable plastic tub. Plastic disrupts hormonal and endocrine systems. After delivery, she stores her placenta in a plastic freezer bag. Plastic is the perfect creation because it never dies. Our daughter sucks on a plastic pacifier. Whales, plankton, shrimp, and birds confuse plastic for food. The plastic pump whirls. Breast milk drips into a plastic bottle. Plastic keeps food, water, and medicine fresh. Yet, how empty plastic must feel. To be birthed, used, then disposed by us, degrading creators. In the oceans, one ton of plastic exists for every three tons of fish. How free plastic must feel when it finally arrives to the paradise of the Pacific gyre. Will plastic make life impossible? Our daughter falls asleep in a plastic crib, and I dream that she's composed of plastic so that she, too, will survive our wasteful hands. Rings of Fire by Craig Santos Perez, Honolulu, Hawaii. We host our daughter's first birthday party during the hottest April in history. Outside, my dad grills meat over charcoal. Inside, my mom steams rice and roasts vegetables. They've traveled from California where drought carves trees into tinder. Paradise is burning. When our daughter's first fever spiked, the doctor said it's a sign she's fighting infection. Bloodshed surges with global temperatures which know no borders. If her fever doesn't break, the doctor continued, take her to the emergency room. Airstrikes detonate hospitals in Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan. When she crowned, my wife said, it felt like rings of fire. Volcanoes erupt along Pacific fault lines. Sweltering heat waves scorch Australia. Forests in Indonesia are raised for palm oil plantations. Their ashes flock like ghost birds to our distant rib cages. Still, I crave an unfiltered cigarette. Even though I quit years ago and my breath no longer smells like my grandpa's overflowing ashtray, his parched cough still punctures the black lungs of cancer and denial. If she struggles to breathe, the doctor advise, give her an asthma inhaler. But tonight we sing happy birthday and blow out the candles together. <sighs> Smoke trembles as if we all exhaled the same flammable 
wish. Blood Ivory by Craig Santos Perez, Honolulu Zoo, World Elephants Day. When we reach the elephant enclosure, I lift our daughter up so she can see them playing in shallow ponds. Look, I say, they love the water just like you. Today, 96 elephants are being massacred across Africa's scarred savanna. Armed poachers surround the herds who stomp, trumpet, and encircle their calves. Bullets, those small human tusks, bite through thick, wrinkled skin. Do the men still feel awe or majesty, or do they only feel their own awful poverty as they sever the incisors once used to split bark and forage? Warlords will sell this white gold to be carved into jewelry, relics, and art, then smuggled across the planet our man-made elephant graveyard. This year, 35,000 will be slain. Our daughter waves goodbye to them as we walk towards the exit. Do we build zoos to save what we've sacrificed, to display what we dominate, or to cage our own wild urge to kill every breathing being. Our daughter plays with a stuffed elephant doll in the gift shop. Look, I say, it has ears, eyes, and a mouth, just like you. She touches its tusks, smiles, then touches her own teeth. We Aren't the Only Species by Craig Santos Perez Who age, who change, who language, who pain, who play, who pray, who save, who mate, who native, who take, who break, who invade, who claim, who taste, who want, who talk, who crawl, who walk, who yawn, who trauma, who laugh, who care, who hear, who fear, who steal, who heal, who friend, who remember, who sex, who nest, who settle, who smell, who help, who eat, who feed, who greed, who sleep, who see, who need, who belong, who bleed, who speak, who breathe, who breathe, who breathe, who think, who drink, who sing, who thirst, who birth, who kill, who smile, who lick, who listen, who kiss, who give, who sick, who piss, who shit, who swim, who migrate, who die, who fight, who cry, who hide, who sign, who mourn, who mourn, who mourn, who work, who school, who tool, who colonize, who bond, who protect, who hope, who lose, who love, who lonely, who touch, who moan, who drown, who hurt, who hunt, who run, who hunger, who nurse, who suffer, who build, who trust, who bury, who future, who house, who house, who house on this our only. The Last Safe Habitat by Craig Santos Perez Dedicated to the Kauai O'o whose song was last heard in 1987. I don't want our daughter to know that Hawaii is the bird extinction capital of the world. I don't want her to walk around the island feeling haunted by tree roots buried under concrete. I don't want her to fear the invasive predators who slither, pounce, bite, swallow, disease, and multiply. I don't want her to see paintings and photographs of birds she'll never witness in the wild. I don't want her to imagine their bones in dark museum drawers. 
I don't want her to hear their voice recordings on the internet. I don't want her to memorize and recite the names of 77 lost species and subspecies. I don't want her to draw a timeline with the years each was first collected and last sighted. I don't want her to learn about the Kauai O'o who was observed atop a flowering ohia tree calling for a mate day after day, season after season, because he didn't know he was the last of his kind. Until one day he disappeared forever into a nest of avian silence. I don't want our daughter to calculate how many miles of fencing is needed to protect the endangered birds that remain. I don't want her to realize the most serious causes of extinction can't be fenced out. I want to convince her that extinction is not the end. I want to convince her that extinction is just a migration to the last safe habitat on earth. I want to convince her that our winged relatives have arrived safely to their destination, a wondrous island with a climate we can never change and a rainforest fertile with seeds and song. Chanting the Waters by Craig Santos Perez for the Standing Rock Tribe and water protectors around the world. Water is life because our bodies are 60% water, because my wife labored for 24 hours through contracting waves, because water breaks forth from shifting tectonic plates. Water is life, because amniotic fluid is 90% water, because she breathed and breathed and breathed, because our lungs are 80% water, because our daughter crowned like a new island. Water is life because we tell creation stories about water, because our language flows from water, because our words are islands writ on water, because it takes more than three gallons of water to make a single sheet of paper. Water is life because water is the next oil, because 180,000 miles of U.S. oil pipelines leak every day, because we wage war over gods and water and oil. Water is life because our planet is 70% water, because only 3% of global water is fresh, because it takes two gallons of water to refine a gallon of gasoline, because it takes 20 gallons of water to make a pound of plastic, because the average American water footprint is 2,000 gallons a day. Water is life because a billion people lack access to drinking water, because women and children walk four miles every day to gather clean water and deliver it home. Water is life, because our bones are 30% are water, because if you lose 5% of your body's water, you become feverish. If you lose 10% of your body's water, you become immobile, because our bodies won't survive a week without water. Water is life because corporations privatize, dam, and bottle our waters, because plantations divert our waters, because animal slaughterhouses consume our waters, because pesticides, chemicals, lead, and waste poison our waters. Water is life because they bring their bulldozers and drills and drones, because we bring our feathers and lay and sage and shells and canoes and hashtags and totems, because they call us savage and primitive and riot, because we bring our treaties and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because they bring their banks and politicians and dogs and paychecks and pepper spray and bullets, 
because we bring our songs and schools and prayers and chants and ceremonies because we say stop keep the oil in the ground because they say shut up and vanish because we are not moving because we bring all our relations all our generations all our live streams water is life because our drumming sounds like rain after drought echoing against taut skin. Because our skin is 60% water. Water is life. Because every year millions of children die from waterborne diseases. Because every day thousands of children die from waterborne diseases. Because by the end of this poem, five children will die from waterborne diseases. Water is life because our daughter loves playing in the ocean. Because someday she'll ask, where does the ocean end? Because we'll point to the dilating horizon. Water is life, because our eyes are 95% water. Because we'll tell her ocean has no end. Because sky and clouds lift ocean. Because mountains embrace ocean into blessings of rain. Because ocean sky rain fills aquifers and lakes. Because ocean sky rain lake flows into the Missouri River. Because ocean sky rain lake river returns to the Pacific and connects us to our cousins at Standing Rock. Because our blood is 90% water. Water is life. Because our hearts are 75% water. Because I'll teach my daughter, our people's word for water, hanum, hanum, hanum. So the sound of water will always carry her home. Water is life. Water is life. Water is life. Dust Song of Justice From Dust to Dust we still speak to one another. It's a hundred years from today. And today, I held your hand earlier. You gently tipped my head from my chin until my forehead stopped in and burrowed in the crock of your neck. Just hold me, just hold me. From dust to dust, between non-entity to non-entity, I, you, we are not human anymore because the world has exploded into nothingness. But I still remembered you, leaving me, loving me. Was there something we could have done to prevent this? The children we brought into this world, we knew, would live and grow into a planet so different from ours. They would not get to see the coast as the rising seas overcome any memories made. Their walks are not gallant as we experience them. Something as simple that we enjoyed, like a seaside walk on the weekends, is a horrifying flight a dreamscape that stereo sounds into our minds. The erosions rises, the land burns in California, and smoke fills the air, and my lungs, and your lungs, and my body, and your body into dust. This is not a horror poem. This is not an apocalyptic poem. This is not an equal justice poem. All I want to do here is testify and to speculate in this poem that is mine. Let me tell you, all the fat millionaires arrived suddenly to the place where no one had wanted to live. But here is water and greenery and here is safety. And so they build bunkers so no one else can live here. And they sing ugly songs and they continue to grow fat and old and stay dumb. 
All I ask of you is to keep me safe, to feed me seaweed, and to commit to living even through the burning earth and us transforming into dust. I cherish water. I cherish you. I crave holding your hand now. I love your handsome face. I love how you look at me. I resolve to the memories made. My babe, my babe, we made life only to see the planet explode in the rising. They made waste. They hid the waste. And they danced all night and day in plastic dresses. I hope to never see them again. I hope they choke on dust. The planet's temperature rises. My temperature falls. Carbon footprints weave us into a world that is just, I want something simple and free. What is time? What is beauty? What is justice? I imagine the children we brought into this world, that they traveled to Mars, a Mars, a planet that is habitable, that is temperate, that is beautiful, that has nature and green, a place where we are free and of light. We are dust, and this is just one song. Hello, my name is Zakaya. I um, was first drawn to, to food justice because I had been working as a waitress and then later a restaurant floor manager for years. And, you know, people would ask a lot of questions about, oh, oh this food, this food, and they wanted stories about the food, you know, and, and, then, and then watching you know, people in the kitchen prepare all of this stuff. And I'm like, oh, I start thinking like, oh, where does all this come, where, where's all this coming from? And then I was like, it would be really cool if I learned how to grow food. Um, and it, it was birthed out of that, out of wanting, wanting to learn more about where food was coming from. And that's how I got to food justice. My name is Pam. I come from Florida. I like, grew up in Miami and very like luscious green Everglades and whatever and came to New York and there's definitely a lot of nature here. It's not that there isn't nature, but I started to realize like how much I, how much plants and nature really affected me on like an emotional level, like health. I felt healthier around plants. I felt better emotionally. So realizing that, then I started, of course, to collect a bunch of plants inside my house. And then I loved flowers. And then I became a, like I trained to be a florist and I just wanted to learn all about plants. And then in growing plants, of course, then it's like growing food and then getting into like food justice and learning all about that and also seeing like bodegas on every corner but no like grocery stores with like some good produce also was um pretty like eye awakening to me and so my name is Jessica I got my first plant after I had a loss of a, a sudden loss of a friend I like walked into this plant store and I got this plant and then that plant turned into like so many 
other plants and it kind of spun a little out of control, I found out that it just made me feel good. And discovering that feeling, I just wanted more of it. So then I was like, how can I make this a daily part of my life? Like, how can this just become what I wake up and, and do? And I discovered this thing called horticultural therapy, which I now have ever growing feelings about. That kind of led me to the, the program where I met Pam and Zakaya. And there were lots of aspects to, to that program, but it changed, I think, my perspective of the society we live in and what role people play in it, what role plants play in it. Yeah. So we all worked for a nonprofit who does horticulture stuff on Rikers Island. When I took that job, I didn't realize exactly what I was getting myself into. And it, it kind of feels like almost yeah. irresponsible. Absolutely. They did not prepare us for what we were going to be dealing with. It was just like, oh, you know, you go and get your clearance badges or whatever, volunteer pass, that's what it was. Get your volunteer pass and then, oh, we're just teaching about mm -hmm. plants. It is so much more than that. And we, it, 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 it took our cohort of instructor, instructors to like, have weekly meetings and we would talk about what we were seeing and we would we would unpack what was happening and it, it and and for that organization it was just like oh we're no we're just teaching plants and it's like it they they it was such a siloed and such a mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. uh way of 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 going about interacting with folks who were on the inside and it it, it, it was just like there was, was growth it was well, really it was, gross. Yeah. It was really gross, and it, it was just like, you know, I mean, we, we've 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 seen people dismissed from the program because they they weren't engaging. They didn't work that day, and it wasn't taken into account that oh, this person had a really shitty phone call with a loved one because there's some, some drama happening in the town. And I mean, it was just so. It was so. I, I'm losing my words, but it was just, it was just so focused on the upper crustness of teaching plants and horticulture and all of that without mm -hmm. taking into account the lives and the background to every, uh, to each participant. That time on Rikers was eye awakening, obviously, and it made me like, think like, fuck plants. <laughs> <laughs> like what the hell are we doing? <laughs> mm -hmm. What the hell is happening here? And I think that's just like nonprofits, like in general, right? Like they're just you know making money off like oppressed peoples, and I guess thinking that they're helping, but like everything, it's just like a band aid or some sort of. Which I have many thoughts on that, and we can rant about that later or whatever. But um, yeah, meeting Jess and Zakaya was great because I feel like we did have these discussions we did talk about all of these things about what we were seeing and we were just like we gotta do things differently like i i i love horticulture i love plants i want to do something different and it, it's unfortunate that this organization has even access to these people the privilege to be around these people who are incarcerated because they literally could be doing they're just doing i feel like more harm than good well, it was often treated like a, like a like a work detail. Work first, garden second, guinea hens third, participants somewhere after that. Absolutely. We got tired of listening to their ass, so we did our own damn thing. Very true. Very true. Yeah, that's that's the gist of it. Yeah. <laughs> when we were all, you know, still working for this organization and trying to leave meetings early and get together with each other and <laughs> make plans. Um, the original thing we were trying, we were trying to build was a, an alternative to incarceration an ATI and imagining what could a, a program 
look like that, you know, would keep people from getting sent to Rikers? When we were on the island, we were coming up with like different ideas. Like one was like, oh, like what if we grew food? I don't know. We we're just like, let's let's get it out to families or let's like think mm-hmm. about food that can be like sent upstate. And, you know, I was getting like in- inspired by like different groups who were trying to like have more contact with people who were incarcerated upstate. Like, I think the alternative to incarceration like was the like first idea but it was no longer like what defined like what we wanted to do because at the end of the day like it is like still like in a form of incarceration it is a band-aid even the csa like so so the csa the friendly csa came about like it really took off over pandemic and alongside the friendly commissary fund which we raise money every other month uh, to send to people on Rikers and upstate. And that's how at first we were actually, that was like the first project we did was the commissary fund. Then decided, okay, like this is like great to support people who are on Rikers. I was like, we also had former students that we had kept in touch with and we're like, we let's support people who are inside. Like Also, we know commissary is important, but we also know that commissary is expensive and like they also don't have many options. So like, let's send food if we can and try to jump through all these hoops that the DOC puts in place so that people can't access anything. We wanted for people to have like choice, like the power of choice and like, We didn't just want to like, it would have been so much easier to be like, we're just going to like put together a box and send that to people. But if there's one thing I learned about working on Rikers is that not everyone loves vegetables. And I certainly don't love vegetables either. But I do know that there's an importance of like, let's, let's let people choose that if they want it and how how much of that it's very tricky because we have to be very clear in our form that like if people are going to receive a package they can get it but it will affect it will like go towards the pound limit because everyone who's incarcerated upstate has a 35 pound limit we want people to have to be able to get the package but we also don't want it to interrupt anything with people's families and that's why choice is so important and we want people to make that decision for themselves whether if they want it one month they don't want it the next month and the choices that they want so we send the newsletter out every month so it usually goes out the in the first week of the month as close to the beginning as we can get it and it always includes like you know, there's always like an introduction letter that's just like, you know, us saying hi and, you know, what's what's going on, what's like an interesting seasonal happening or event or, I don't know, current event or something. And then we always highlight uh, one of the choices, you know, say one of the choices was potatoes, then there's, you know, an introduction to potatoes like what are potatoes like when what what part of the plant are you eating and then there's a little more kind of like gardening info on it like when do you plant them how long do they take to grow like what is a seed potato why why don't we plant potatoes from an actual an actual seed when do you harvest them how do you store them all that good information and then we include a recipe Because it's just like, not only is it like multiple of the ingredients, but it's like usually a recipe that doesn't, isn't complicated. Like, you know, you don't need like a ton of cooking equipment or like stove top. And soon we're going to get the quarterly newsletter out. It's called Yard Talk. And and the the intention behind it is to have more stories, people's uh, stories shared and maybe a little less about food, but, you know, just focusing on members and participants and their experiences and whatever they like to share with, um, with other folks who are going to be reading that quarterly newsletter. 
it would be really awesome to get people's voices that i mean we've we've talked about a lot about like getting maybe like a recipe like zine out or like getting a lot of like more feedback with cooking stuff on the internet because we we do get a lot of um we do get feedback saying like a lot of people like love to share like food and then they share meals together like the csa boxes they get like super excited and share with others who are not getting the csa and it's just like really great to hear that there's just like community being built around a healthy meal or whatever or not a healthy meal but just some good food and yeah i'd love to just like know more about like what they're cooking or and maybe if they want to share that with other people or not we we want to also include more resources with other like organizations who are doing mm-hmm. that work inside out work this the csa and the commissary are our main two projects um at the moment so we're still going to focus on those so a lot of a lot of what like what we took from Rikers was like a lot of like friendships or like acquaintances that we made on the inside and who we um, wanted to continue to be in communication with if they of course wanted to and because of that I feel like there is a lot of like thinking about um, yeah like what you would do for your friend like right like support them in whatever way and we were like before CSA or like outside of Roots and Bound um, we were going upstate to visit some of these uh, former students that we had just to bring them packages or, and we're still in touch with them and all of that. But I think it is um, important to keep communication with people on the inside. Also knowing like how to better support people inside with the feedback that's given. You know, something that I can recall, you know, people like a, a fear common thing is you know, being like forgotten being able to kind of continue to show up for people that we've built relationships with um, and friendships, I think, in some cases with. Kale, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Kale, yeah. <laughs> it's nice to get together and like really like get to continue like the love to share that love of horticulture and like growing stuff and like just being like kind of planty nerds, you know, doing something you love and then also just like hoping that that love is then shared further inside through like CSA or commissary and whatever. The COVID rates inside, at least some of the women's facilities have been really, really bad, like just people on full-on quarantine and i don't know it's it's so hard a lot of times you just feel like sometimes a little hopeless but um i feel like like a lot of the foods we send obviously they're vegetables they all have like very like nourishing properties and whatever but i think we just wanted to make something that was like like uh honey and like ginger and garlic and something that they can like concoct and um we put tea in there but tea and like cough drops or anything that's like that that like even like says herbal or medicinal on the box will be like thrown away like it will not Mm -hmm. be accepted by the doc so it's very like sometimes we'll take chances and we'll try to send stuff in and either stuff will get sent back to us or the person will never receive like the person won't receive that one thing but they'll receive everything else i guess for every month we we do seasonal stuff of course but we'll throw in like fun special option that's also seasonal in the sense that like if it's like holiday related or whatever but for like december i think we included like the option of cookies as a treat and someone was like um, I want five pounds of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> Nothing else. Just send me the cookies. Like, and they wrote it. Just like, like, lots of cookies, please. And I was like, okay. 
<laughs> just stuffed a box full of like whatever cookie box packaging is allowed because they're very particular about that too so that was fun it's such a bummer that we can't send food to folks inside Rikers because like I, I mean I'm just thinking about like the situation going on right now and right right now folks are allowed one piece of fruit a day and most times that fruit is rotten the food can be you know a hug of sorts you know like hey we see you and we acknowledge that you're in there and and you know we like it, it, i mean it's like pam said i mean we're we're not necessarily solving anything but like this, just some fucking kindness and and acknowledging that that people are there it's an acknowledgement when we were teaching on Rikers we thought about this often about how you know this nonprofit you know they're just like oh we do all this healing work horticultural therapy and like the garden and listen there is no denying that our students like loved being outside like in the garden some of them not all of them but they like enjoyed it and there was something beautiful and relaxing and like there was something great for them but all of that got erased the minute they stepped back into that jail like just completely erased i mean that there is no healing done really i mean the system the system is so violent i mean it was all undone so and i i think we thought about that a lot and i think with this i think when i think about friendly csa you know what we're doing isn't I mean, I wish I wish there was like no prisons, right? But if there's there are prisons now, I wish they had at least healthier, like access to healthier food that wasn't like four dollars for a small head of broccoli. And I think CSA isn't meant to be like, oh, we're going to like, I don't know, we're not, we're, we're we aren't gonna like solve anything. I mean, I think the idea is just to like support people while we can, make sure people like remember that like give them the opportunity of to have some choice and to have options and to have a something else but we know it's not like the solution or anything and and we know that if the doc got like fresh organic vegetables tomorrow that we still would want the prisons not to exist and we still know that it'll Mm -hmm. still be violent you know just just how we uh, we oppose all the new jails that they want to build in the city. We oppose Rikers and we oppose the new jails. I was led to abolition through the program where I met Jess and Pam. Going going to the island whenever we had classes and just seeing what the hell was going on, the treatment of people, and I was like, I was like, this 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 shit don't make sense. This is not. I don't know. I just, I just believed in there has to be another way to, to support people. There just has to be another way. That was what fed me and, and led me deeper into this, this, this future of, of abolition. And abolition has been like more of, I feel that word didn't really mean anything to me many years ago when I was like younger and like doing a lot of like earth first, like letter writing, supporting like eco activists. And I think that that word wasn't in my vocabulary, but I understood it already. I understood that the systems in place were not working. And I understood it, I think for like, right, these people that I definitely looked up to for doing such radical work but it wasn't until I started working on Rikers Island where it further radicalized me to see that this system really is like does not work it should be abolished it affects everyone literally everyone and that I think was truly eye-awakening and then there was this whole movement of like abolition and you know, Miriam Kava was like a big person who taught me and many other people have taught me so much about it. But 
yeah, I think definitely just being in like radical circles also has definitely uh, paved this this path to abolition. You know, when you know when you know words, like the definition of a word, but you don't know it. Like you 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 have an idea of what it of what it is, but then you know when you're so kind of confronted with a situation and and you you come face to face with what it is that word becomes real and then and you start to really feel the meaning of it and i and i think i didn't really like understand our carceral system and i didn't really understand what abolition was or could look like you know until people that you came into contact with you know made it seem real and made it seem possible and and made it seem like a large thing that was kind of changing in people's minds just even thinking about like all of these mutual aid groups and like obviously we were just trying to like care for each other and and not forget about our community and i think it's the same for like sending people food inside and talking to people inside and that's why all, all these letter writing groups are so important because keeping in touch with people inside is so important. We just do it in a way that's more like, here's some vegetables <laughs> if you want them. <laughs> um, but we know it's not like the answer and it's not gonna like save anything, but we, we hope in the meantime to fight for actual liberation. Keep your gorilla gardening going. Hmm. <laughs> you ready? Yes, I'm I'm ready. Let, let's go for it. Okay. In the, the world of disturbance <laughs> or redisturbance, right? <laughs> world of disturbance and redisturbance, a conversation. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ellie uh, and this is Andrea. We're here to discuss and feel and move through themes of natural cultural disturbance. In just a moment, we're going to invite you to confront and process disturbance by moving with us. Thanks so much, Ellie, to open us up into the world of disturbance and redisturbance. And with that, hearing everybody's here, and we see you, you are here. Let's ground ourselves for a second. And just feel like your whole body mass, just sinking into the floor. You maybe sink into your chair. And then even your breath maybe takes you further down into your feet. And notice how your feet touching the ground with your whole body mass just pouring into the floor and how the floor comes up to you and the floor goes further down into the next floor until to the soil and you just both touching each other. This idea in between of this energy and let's just take a breath there of landing and thinking what land are you are on and what this means to you. Now we have a five minute video to share with you, inviting you to move together with us. Thank you. 
Thanks for moving with me, Andrea. Thanks, Ellie, for moving with me. And thanks for everybody else that is here moving with us. Yes. The imagery that we just experienced together is drawn from our divergent and intersecting engagements with land disturbance. Over the last year, Andrea has been witnessing and caring for attempts at land defense on Lenape land of Manhattan, uh, land currently known as East River Park in current day New York City. Here, a group of community members defend the lives of a thousand mature trees and the many diverse living beings who live with them on this land, sandwiched between the highway and the shoreline asking for flood protection that is in partnership with the trees in the land. They resist an act of violence that destroys every living being on this 50 acres of parkland, which has grown and matured in the more than 80 years since it was built on landfill in 1939. Yeah. And while you, Ellie, has been working with turf grass monoculture, 
um, alkalons, right? Um, on the Mohican lands of currently now Troy, New York, um, as part of the long redisturbance um, laboratory. Um, you're removing like one by one meter square feet of this lawn to create these public sculptures that are shaped and sculpted by weedy disturbance oriented plants, right? Um, and this, this project um, really imagines and enacts this unlearning experience to create opportunities for building um, plant human solidarity in disturbed urban, suburban, and ex-urban habitats. And just, just this two opposition that we we playing in it um, is really very striking um, to me. Yeah, that's what brought us to the theme of disturbance and working through it together. And um, we thought one way we could guide ourselves in talking about this because so much of it is so physical and so grounded and translating it onto the screen is, is challenging, um, would be to guide ourselves through investigating, breathing and moving through a range of definitions of disturbance. So starting with words, but um, translating some of their definitions into other ways of communicating. Um, so we'll start with one drawn from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. <laughs> uh, so disturbance is the act of disturbing someone or something. The act of disturbance someone or something. What is for you someone and what is something really occurs me thinking about the park when they just came in and take everything and it was more a something. And for us defenders, um, it is someone is subjective. It has a living and has a being. Yeah, um, for sure. In that very first definition, I see that binary that there are beings in this world that are things that are objects and there are those that are someones that are infused with agency in life and i think um one of the things that we're both thinking about is the someoneness of so many of the things that we're surrounded by creatures plants soil yeah and then yeah and with that of just thinking also when there's some one is even like a, in the process of composing and changing right this one slice of one of the tree that they cut that was just left over and it inviting itself and taking it home and over time it changes that cut wasn't there first and over time in being in here in the air, it changes. And it's even that state of composing, right? The state of decomposing, like, is there, what is there that change? Is that also considered a change of disturbance? It goes into another place, right? Yep. There's a lot more parts to this. Merriam-Webster definition. Um, the next one is the state of being disturbed. Yeah, that my heart feels that one. <laughs> Your heart feels that one. Um, that my heart feels that. that one. Yeah, yeah um, I have to say, completely. in in I mean, you know, you it's like a heartbreak, like you know that the state of disturbance somebody happens to you traumatically, and it totally inside disturbs you. But from towards um, ecological thing, towards land and towards tree, this this is river park. This disturbance, violence on this on this land is the first time that I explored it so deeply on that level. I explored it before on a human level, mm -hmm. but on, on the state of disturbance, 
on literally on that level um, is very intense. And it, and it just always brings me right, like how it is for people even, I didn't live in the park, right? I'm not, this is not, I'm around the park. I started to know the park, right? What is it if it's all your livelihood? And maybe it is our all livelihood, but it brings me to other places like in the Amazon and all these places where, where everything gets taken and how much, and what kind of healing does it need when you get experience that's disturbing? So I, and that was, so that coming to that, I was then such thinking this caring and tending that you have in your lawn square and that hope in yeah. that when then this very different plants coming like instead two like lawn and two other plants there's suddenly this 10 15 plants mm -hmm. and there is this hope of living and diversity to me yeah yeah they're both acts of disturbance and i think that's what drew us to having this conversation and putting these images together that i don't think we would have thought to put together otherwise oh. and um in terms of like the heartbreak, I think I'm responding to these lawns, which have been breaking my heart for 20 years <laughs> with their <laughs> insistence of um, this kind of monoculture blankness that coats the land and this kind of uh, mockery of an ecosystem. <laughs> and that there's some relief for me in that long running heartache. I feel that um, to like take this tool and push it into the turf That's and acknowledge right. this is the living system and then do that movement. Yeah. And you exactly. hear the ripping and pulling, you feel the resistance of the turf. It wants to stay there. It is alive. We acknowledge that when we disturb something, whether it's done with care and intention or it's done treating the land as a thing, as we talked about with that first definition, someone or something. Exactly. Disturbed. But and that, I think I am in a state of disturbance when I do it, <laughs> and I work through some of that. Um, and that's part of what this movement that we were trying to do in the beginning with this video, I think <laughs> really just feeling like this driving beat and these images coming together was somehow productive for us for working through that heartache. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then the other disturbance also being a disturbance. I may, I'm not sure if you are already on that definition. We'll come to a de definition that gets to that, I think. Let's, let's, so we... let's get to that definition because, you know, that... that yeah, so we'll right get a few other examples from yeah. definition one in Merriam-Webster because if we skip to definition two, we see that we come to noisy or violent activity commotion was in all caps um, and i'm not sure if that's maybe what you were thinking about well actually i can put it in that way. we became we defender because you know we will be in uh, in front of the gates right before they put yeah. the gate up the first day and it's actually literally three months where this first time happens right and so they wanted to put the gate up and we just sit on that line where the gates are coming up and we sit it the whole day and the police come in and we had to move, right? And some got arrested, but then we consistently, you know, would show up every day. And always Getting like- a disturbance. <laughs> and yeah, always tell them and, and like, this, stop it. And then also we were crying, right? When that the tree in, in the middle of the, when you hear that sound, actually that was, this is real, that was real that when that tree came down, it just came out of our body, but we were everyday present, right? Witnessing and repressed. So we became actually for them that disturbance. And, yeah. and, and after two months, it helped us at least, and it's not on, on one section that they will take later on away. We were able to hold back them a little that they didn't took everything yet. And so, but it was interesting. They even say to us, you are really in our way. You're disturbing our work. And so I was like- I What's was the work? Whose labor? <laughs> yeah, so our own body being just present and watching and witnessing and just asking them, you know, you ha we have to find another way. We cannot just 
kill everything for flood protection. We need to recognize that they have already knowledge as well, right? Yeah. Maybe we can pause mm -hmm. and just breathe with that a little while um, with the knowledge of whew, the plant beings that are around us all the time who we breathe with, yeah. even when we're inside. Mm -hmm. And I'll come back to another part of the Merriam-Webster definition, which is um, a departure from a norm or standard, a deviation, disruption, or impairment in form, function, or activity such as sleep disturbances or endocrine disturbances. Which of course relates to what you were just talking about in terms of the norms of the folks carrying out the work, which they- Dust Song of Justice, from dust to dust, 